Just wait. We will formally start the program. Okay, program. Right. Yes, sorry about all of that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry for the, the, the simple kind of some uh, disturbances about that. A couple of minutes. Okay, formally I uh, invited Professor Dr. R. Nagarajan sir, principal and the head of the Department of Zoology and Wildlife Biology. Uh, formally, he will welcome the gathering and uh, uh, that uh, hero of the today talk, Dr. Sutherland, Professor Sutherland sir. And uh, so I invite Dr. Professor Dr. R. Nagarajan sir, we welcome as well as presidential address. Please, over to you sir. Thank you, Dr. Pandian. Very good evening to every one of you. The most respected and distinguished professor uh, of uh, uh, Cambridge University and uh, our uh, resource person for today's uh, web seminar, uh, Professor Sutherland, and uh, all my uh, teachers uh, who are in the screen, and uh, all my colleagues uh, who are with us today, and all the students, participants from my department and other departments, and various participants from different parts of the world. Let me take this opportunity to welcome you all for this nice occasion. Let me take this opportunity first to thank the most busiest person, Bill Sutherland, agreed to give this web seminar. Thank you very much, Bill, for your wonderful and valuable time. We are very sorry for May, uh, for making you to get more stress for uh, using this computer. We are very sorry for that. And I am sure that now it is everything perfect. It is going to go okay. And uh, before uh, starting this uh, pr uh, program, just would like to have a few words with uh, each and every one of you in the uh, meeting. And uh, uh, most of you know very well Bill Sutherland, uh, who is a very well known uh, ecologist, uh, now became a complete conservation biologist, uh, who has been doing enormous amount of uh, work, uh, research, not only in conservation, and he is bringing a lot of conservation actions. And uh, most of you would have read his book because he recently, within that last 10 years, he edited as well as he has written several books. I always admire one of his earliest books, which is called Individual Behavior to Population Ecology, which is in the poster too, which is a wonderful book and giving all the complicated ecological concepts in a very simple and natural manner. And the next book, Ecological Methods, he described as well as edited and uh, that is the book after uh, uh, ecological methodology clubs books which, which became out of print and it has had all the old methods but uh, Bill Sutherland's book uh, edited book has had all the uh, wonderful uh, ecological methods in different aspects and subsequently bird conservation in which he described quite a lot of methods pertaining to bird studies particularly a lot of people still know that we have to shoot the bird and we have to cut the intestine and take the content that we have to study put up its analysis but in his book he has given 11 different methods which are all being used very efficiently and the most uh, 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 lovable manner to save the bird uh, uh, you need not kill the bird but you can clearly assess all the food habits of that book so if i talk about all his book i can talk for hours most probably it is going to be my talk rather than his talk therefore i will stop here and uh, bill sutherland i am so happy as well as uh, 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 at this juncture I remember his uh, juncture, uh, gestures during my PhD uh, time. I met him 2017 first time in University of Oxford. Oxford University usually has uh, the first week of January or second week of January a conference for all the students. All the young students will be coming and presenting. All the big stalwarts will be sitting in front of us. Sometime maybe sitting next to you. You may not know that is the person who is uh, either Professor Bill Sutherland or Bill uh, 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 Professor Ian uh, Newton or uh, Professor John uh, Krabs or Professor uh, Nick Davies. So everybody comes there and they sit in the conference and they encourage all the youngsters to give wonderful Talk. In fact, uh, that is the place when I, I went first time to present in Oxford University. I was uh, standing on the 
toes and it was a very big nalaraking exercise for me and still i do remember that i gave a talk at the end professor chris prince came to me and he said that i feel sad for you because you are feeling cold but uh, still you are doing the wonderful work likewise there are lot of people encouraged in the same way 2017 when i met first time professor bill sutherland he also encouraged me before that i knew that he is going to be my examiner because in the first year of phd itself who is going to be your examiner will be decided in uk and you can follow their work and you can look at very nicely that is the occasion and in fact in the oxford conference he was there that conference name will still you remember individuals to population that was the topic of the conference where you have given a talk which was amazing talk you demonstrated the talk population crisis and how carrying capacity occurs by moving all the participants from one corner to another corner subsequently ja, uh, our uh, uh most probably you also feel teacher i also feel teacher dr john gaskester he gave a wonderful talk in the same year we have had another conference in association study of animal behavior in uh, england uh, in london where you have given the same talk, uh, uh, another talk about the population and individual they are all uh, memorable period and we really learnt a lot during that time and the bs conference again that the conference takes place in every december professor sutherland involved with the british ecological society for several years and he is the first one to introduce the gratis copy scheme uh, in uh, through bs and all his books are being circulated all over the world Where, uh, from the internet what i found almost uh, some 9000 books are being circulated in 137 countries which is big old information most probably he will tell now it is being circulated more than that and uh, in fact i am also very happy to tell that uh, one of the papers uh, dr john gaskester has written in uh, biological review we are almost uh, some uh, 42 authors are there i i am also one of the others with the professor bill sutherland and in which which is one of the very highly cited paper and uh, most of us who worked with john gaskester are being included in that paper and that paper was published some time back but uh, that paper has data before my birth from onwards so there are uh, wonderful papers which he has authored and uh, as i pointed out uh, he was uh, my external examiner still i do remember it is uh, uh, everybody uh, believes that uh, uh, phd viva is the most nerve wracking exercise lot of even british students shared with me that uh, they have had the most uh, Uh, intimidating time during the phd viva time so i went uh, that time for viva almost uh, professor sutherland took four hours to conduct that viva during that time uh, that viva was the most fascinating and wonderful time i can remember in my whole phd thesis time in fact he not only assessed my uh, uh, thesis he also taught me how to assess the youngsters how to assess uh, the youngsters uh, uh, work and uh, how to motivate the youngsters to do wonderful work so from cambridge uh, uh, oxford as well as from my own viva i learned a lot at this juncture i am also very happy to tell that in england there are two different uh, birds which are being extensively studied if you go to the terrestrial system it is called tit great tit or blue tit are the two tits which are being extensively studied by british ecologist in several ways the next one oyster catchers in aquatic ecosystem most often people used to say oyster catcher as a aquatic tit because lot of people do work and we work a lot of people with under john gaskester as well as with john gaskester bill completed his phd thesis during 1980 that was the thesis ice catches and cocoons yeah predator prey study which is the wonderful thesis and from there he published several papers one of the papers in animal behavior that's the ice catches select the most profitable cocoons which is a very highly cited paper and subsequently he has written enormous amount of paper i don't need to tell uh, publishing one paper in nature is a very very big thing but professor bill sutherland published it 
build it as far as I know, almost uh, 60 papers in nature. And apart from that, he has had some 750 papers in different uh, recent publications. If I talk, I can talk forever about uh, Bill because he is not only a uh, not only a good scientist, he is a great human being. I experienced it and I interacted with him quite a lot. Not only uh, Professor Bill Sutherland, the associate which he has with a uh, lot of other people like uh, Dr. John Gaskested and uh, um, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Skitcher, Steelman, and all the people are really, really very good people. They really enjoy all the youngsters to do wonderful work. But still, he is continuing. Apart from that, now he is in different committees, very most probably busiest uh, uh, ecologist uh, in UK, and he agreed to give this talk for us at this juncture. Once again, on, be on behalf of you all, I thank you. And uh, well, I love to talk more about you as well as the work and the experience I have had with you all in England, but I don't have much time to left with these things. Once again, I welcome you all, and uh, I'm sure that the next few hours are going to be a most productive and enjoyable hours. He is not only a great scientist, as I pointed out, a great human being, more than that, wonderful speaker. So most probably he will be entertaining for the next uh, few hours with uh, all the ecological concept in a very uh, lucid manner. Therefore, anybody can understand. So with these things, once again, I welcome you, uh, welcome you all, the participants, uh, and interact with him. He is one of the most astonishing scientists as well as ecologists with him you can interact today. With these things, once again, I thank for this opportunity and uh, over to you, Dr. Pandyan. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your uh, exhaustive, you know, welcome address as well as present address about the topic and also Professor Dr. William yes, Sutherland, sir, sir, with your experience uh, when you are uh, associated with that uh, Professor at the UK. Uh, thank you once again, sir. Uh, Professor Sutherland, sir. Yeah, he is uh, there. You can talk. Things are okay, but I think he is minimizing the presentation. So that is why he is struggling. I think so. So where? So I'm on some. I'm on a um, Mac. It's not my machine. Um, uh, you just you just maximize your presentation. No problem. Can you get that? Yeah, that's cool. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. Now. I, this is Alice, who's another clever person. <laughs> what okay. Can, what yes, I can see that one, please. Okay, yeah, please, actually, please. It's it's nice, 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 it, just wait, it's a few seconds. I would like to introduce yourself, then you can say to a start. Okay, uh, uh, please. Eh? Uh, I'm Dr. Jeev Pandey, and would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. William Sutherland. He is one among the legend, legends in the field of conservation science. Uh, I, I now presently he is working Miriam Rothschild Professor of Conservation Biology, University of Cambridge, United Kingdom, and most of the things already Dr. Professor or Nagarajan sir uh, mentioned uh, during his, his presentation address. address. And a few things I would like to add about uh, Dr. William Sutherland. I think we don't want to introduce who is Sutherland sir. sir. He is well known person. <laughs> he is globally, and uh, he is you know. Uh, example for how to work for the in the field of conservation science and uh, wildlife and management and he has uh, uh, rewarded with many awards for his reputed work and also for his contribution uh, towards his uh, natural science and conservation uh, a few things i would like to mention now the, since the time is going a scientific medal uh, awarded by zoological society of london during 1997 and he has also awarded with the Marsh Award for Ecology by the British Ecological Society 2001. And Marsh Award for Conservation Biology again, the Zoological Society of London during 2005. Then he awarded with the Ecological Engagement Award by the British Ecological Society 2012. And District Service Award, Society for Conservation Biology 2013. Sir John Burnett Memorial Lecture Medal uh, he received during 2013. Besides, the popular books, the entire conservation handbook on uh, from individual uh, behavior to population biology. And also additionally, he edited a number of books. As for example, Managing Habitat for Conservation, Ecological Census Technique,
behavior and the conservation conservation science and auction and bird ecology and conservation likewise we can countless number of books he has edited and published and the very important thing is we are trying from the day one to publish a small one or two lines in nature but the professor sutherland published nearly 58 paper in nature that is he is very big asset today we are having such a extraordinary individual and personality today really professor dr sutherland sir this is our lucky day it's a historical day and one among the significant events in our lifetime so we are having in our college and also we are very much pleased to give our uh, very humble thanks to you uh, since you are accepting our uh, you know our beloved uh, invitation and you uh, know uh, you are also introduced by dr nagarajan sir he told me several things about you i think you remember i i met you at the cambridge university in the department of zoology museum and the whale skeleton you taught me about what are all the uh, Uh, endoskeleton exoskeleton it was very nice moment for me <laughs> but at that time i don't know i very sorry after return to india then i recognized that then i when i was looking uh, and citing several papers about to you you know whenever i am going to see that uh, several journals you no know, uh, look at your name as editor in chief and editorial board so it is very amazing professor once again welcoming you and uh, now the session is uh, no uh, over to you professor uh, uh, thank you professor please, please you can, you can uh, start, start your, your uh, talk now thank you can i say i'm is the volume all right is this volume are you happy can you yeah, hear yeah. clearly yeah yeah fine so, uh, i'd like to thank you for the invitation and uh, and it's good to see some old friends again i have fond memories of both of you and and um meeting you in uh, the museum and uh, the student conference and uh lots of discussions in exeter about oyster catchers and many discussions since so i've uh, i've very fond memories of both uh and uh, and it sounds as though you're doing lots of exciting work in india all of you so yeah it's great i'm very happy to be here. so what i'd like to talk about today i'd like to talk about how we can make conservation better how can we do this field in a better way so that we uh and i want to do two things i want us to make it more efficient so it's more likely to work and also if we make it more efficient i think it will be better funded because funders will see that it is likely to work and they'll invest money in it so i want both it to be more efficient and there to be more money in conservation so that we can do more so i want to have a debate i want to say do we want to deliver more effective conservation do we think that's an important issue if we do what would that look like and what could we do in order to achieve that uh, that aim so i was chatting to my colleague mark bergman on a zoom call and he made what i thought was an interesting point he said when you deliver science if you look at engineering engineering is based on physics but what we really should be thinking about is in conservation ecology conservation is actually the application of ecology so the sort of studies we've heard about the, the foraging studies of oyster catchers that's pure ecology but we can take that information and we can apply it so that becomes conservation so it is the cutting edge of our science and that's what we want to do so it seems to me we have four principles i think we want to plan for achieving conservation aims we want to make sure we have an inclusive global community involving everyone we want to have a a, a toolbox of tools we can use and i think we should just do everything better and i'd like to start off with that last point so there's an idea called kaizen which is it comes from japan and so a toyota i'm sure you have lots of toyota land cruisers in india uh toyota is an extremely efficient company and it has this process called kaizen and kaizen simply means do better And so everyone in Toyota 
is trying to do better. Whether they're designing the cars or selling the cars or running the accounts, they're always saying, is there a better, more efficient way of doing things? And they're doing that right across the Toyota company. And that means Toyota does better uh, and they make better and cheaper and more efficient cars. And that's so the question is, do we want Kaizen conservation? Do we want conservation? We just go and do everything and there's no cause for more. What I like to do is, I like to put forward 15 points of fact in order that we can do conservation. And this is my 15 terms, and I had, uh, I, what I'm going to do is just run through one of these. First thing, I want a plan for delivering global change. And you can feel this as a very simple equation. You can say the change in the targets, the targets connected with natural biodiversity, the change in the targets quite simply equal the gains minus the losses. That's obvious. The amount of biodiversity equals the amount more we have minus the amount that we lose. And we can then expand that a bit. So the target might be, you know, what bit of biodiversity we want. Uh, I won't talk about that much. But the gains, the gains really are the scale in which we do conservation times the effectiveness. So the gains, if you want to scale it up, we want to identify where we want to carry out this conservation, which are the countries that are most important, how can we increase society so they're more aware of it? How can we convince businesses that they need action? How can we get more funding into conservation? If we do that, we'll have more conservation action, we'll have more areas protected, more conservation programs, governments increasingly acting, businesses' decisions increasingly protecting the family. That's how we scale it up. If you want to make it more effective, we want to identify effective solutions. We want to then collaborate globally in order to bring those about. We want to make sure there's guidance so people know how to carry those out. We want to make sure that there's an army of people that are capable of doing that uh, through training courses, through the sort of, you know, uh, the work that's being done uh, by you lot uh, and well by our student conference. Um, and there's a student conference in India as well. We want to increase capacity. We want to improve the decision-making process so that evidence is used. We want to make sure that there's effective governance so that um, organizations can work out what to do. And if we achieve that, we'll have more effective conservation, and conservation will be seen as a sort of cost-effective. So that's how we, we increase the gains. How do we reduce the losses? I really want to work out how do you reduce the demand, and this might be for forestry or food or um, uh, whatever we're talking about, marine fish. How can we reduce the demand? How can we make the, it more efficient? How can we create alternatives? How can we devise effective land use policies? And if we put those together, we'll have strategies for food and energy and the environment and timber and infrastructure. That's reducing threats. So what I've tried to do here is there's nothing new here. This is taking the areas of conservation that people are thinking about. But I've tried to put it in one framework and say this is all what we need to do in order to solve the main conservation problem. It's just creating a structure for thinking about how we can do conservation. So secondly, uh, I'm concerned that um, conservation is largely seen as English. An awful lot of the, 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 the journals are in English, the, the way information is given out is in English. Uh, and that seems to be a terrible mistake. So. Uh, Tatsu Amano, there's a picture of him at the bottom. Tatsu Amano is exceedingly clever. His, um, his daughter will be very clever. He's teaching her to read by uh, looking at nature there. So I think she'll turn out to be a very clever child. Um, 
But Tatsuya uh, did some great work whereby we looked at uh, the terms biodiversity conservation in different languages in different Google search engines for different languages. And that showed that 35% of the literature on biodiversity conservation is not in English. There's a lot of it in other languages, particularly Spanish and Portuguese and Chinese, etc. And by ignoring that like the global literature, we're missing out uh, on a lot of the global information. And that is a great, uh, that's a big mistake. And so one of the things we're doing is we're uh, have an army of people that have read 350,000 titles in 12 different languages and they're reading a wide range of different journals to make sure we pull out the global literature uh, on a range of languages. And here, um, uh, I had nothing to do with this, this is some work by Ko Kono and Tatsuya Amano. And what they did is that they looked at analyses, analyses that have been done, and they then looked at the literature that was also in Japanese that had been ignored, and showed that if you included the Japanese literature alongside the English literature, you often got very different results. So by excluding the literature and just looking at English, you don't get the right answer. So it is a big mistake to just think about the literature in English. We need to look at the global literature. The third thing I'd like to talk about is how we have more inclusive global participation. How do you make it a global community? And I very much like uh, ideas and suggestions at the end, if people have any ideas what we could do. So we've been doing a couple of things. As has been said, we've been have this um, gratis book scheme where we used to give away lots of free books, and, and we, we still, still do that. that. But more importantly, now we make books open access. So this book on the left, Conservation Research Policy and Practice, uh, we insisted that it was open access, and it's the first British Ecological Society book that is now open access, so anyone can read it. Uh, we produce this book each year, What Works in Conservation? That is open access. And then with Richard Primack, who I know well, we had discussions and I mentioned the people we work with, and he's now produced this book on Sub-Saharan Africa, which is open access, and he's producing lots of books around the world. I don't know if he's produced one for India, but it'd be great if he did. Um, uh, and I think it's really important that you have books that talk about local, uh, issues uh, and that are open so anyone can use them. So you don't have to pay a lot of money because these books are very expensive otherwise, uh, a lot of money to get them. And then the other thing is just making sure that, that it's readable in different languages. So Conservation Evidence, the journal we work with, it can be downloaded. Uh, you just, you know, with Google Translate, uh, you can just translate it in different languages. And I don't I'm sure you're going to tell me this doesn't make entire sense because Google Translate never does. But I think you can probably probably understand it. Probably can. But still, is a make a lot of uh, understanding. It is reasonably workable. Oh, good. Okay. And, it, and it's. I'm um, amazed to see the Tamil in your presentation. Therefore, I was looking at that one closely. Now I understood. It is nice. <laughs> good. Yeah. I'm. I'm afraid it's not. The rest isn't going to be in Tamil. <laughs> And so what we do, but, but so the whole website, you can read the whole website in Tamil. So uh, you can't search in Tamil, I'm afraid, but um, all of it, you just press that button at the top and it translates the whole thing. So what we do is we pull together, we read the global literature, and then we pull it together uh, in these, what we call synopses, these books on birds and conservation. Um, we've just done one on mammal conservation. Uh, um, so we're very pleased with that. And this just shows how it works in English, I'm afraid, this time. But it says um, you can search the literature. So let us imagine we search the link literature here for roads. So I just type in road. 
when it then gives a list of the different actions, the 84 different ways in which you can, you can reduce the problems of roads on biodiversity. So easy to do, the, the top one, you can use tunnels for amphibians, the second one, you can have underpasses for bats, the third one, you can have overpasses, and so on and so on. And then if you click the, the tunnels for amphibians, it shows a map where the studies are, and it shows a very easy to understand summary of all the information about those studies, and with a summary that gives you a lot of detail as to when and where it works. And then finally, if you then click on those studies, you'll see that each of those studies is described in one paragraph. So the idea is before it was very difficult for people to read the literature on a conservation problem. And this means you can just look it up immediately. You can look it up and you can see what, um, what are the different solutions for my problem, and um, what are the range of options. Can you still see that's still working? It's changed on my screen. Are you happy? Uh, Okay, people. Yeah, we lost wait a minute. Is it working? Supporting evidence from individual studies. Yeah, it's working. Right, right. 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 it's working. Yeah, proceed, proceed. Okay, I can see nine pictures. So that's only one of them. But can you see? It's okay, is it? Yeah. JP, I am unable to see. Yeah, the participant list will go. Amila on the pin pan. Okay, okay. Just pin it. Amila Hood, presentation pin pan. Most probably now it is all right. What is the approach? Ask him to press me. Bill, you can continue. Okay. Um, so the idea is that you can take the global literature. Uh, so you, so you, you want to know, you've got a problem. There's a problem that animals are dying on your roads. What do you do? You can then look it up and you can immediately see what the whole range of options are. And you can immediately then look to see all the studies there are, and then you can decide what to do. So it takes the review time down from what would normally take a year to do uh, to something that you can do very quickly. And we then classify how well it works using this uh, scoring here. So if it's very effective and there's a high certainty, we call it beneficial. Uh, and if there's less certainty, we call it likely to be beneficial. But if there's very low certainty, we call it unknown effectiveness. So we can score all the different studies uh, and then say, how likely is this particular action to work? OK, next issue I'd like to talk about is reducing the barriers to uh, education globally. And one of the things we've done here is there's a new journal coming out. And there's a new uh, called Ecological science and evidence and linked to that is a website called applied ecological resources so we've uh, brought together a set of lectures and teaching materials and reading lists and workshops on evidence-based conservation uh, and all of this will be stored on this website which should come out in the next month or two and then we have 103 educators from 19 countries are going to teach this material and so we provided the material and we provided an army of people that are going to teach it and i think we probably need a lot more of that i think we should think about what the global community wants and how we can collect information that teachers around the world can then use and then say i'd like to teach this subject 
I can take these courses, I can combine it with my own material, my own examples, and then use that to teach. It seems that's a very um, useful thing for us to do. Uh, next, how do we work as a global community? So one of the issues we I'd like to give the example of, there's, um, there's a, a, a quote, standing on the shoulders of giants. So Newton, uh, the great mathematician and physicist, said he could only see so far because he was standing on the shoulder of giants. There were all these thinkers beforehand that had great ideas, and he was then building on them. So my concern is that when you look at conservation, it turns out that we, in many papers, we don't actually talk about the other work that's been done. So I call this standing on the toes of giants. We're not bringing together the global information and saying, this is what we know. I'm going to add my bit on top of that. And then this is the whole thing that we know. So we're not standing on the shoulders of giants. We're standing on the toes of giants. So let's see if this works. So we worked with uh, all of these different journals. And all of these different journals, I think there's over 40 journals around the world, have now changed the way in which they work so as to ensure that the people that publish the papers there uh, refer to the existing literature. So we're working as a global community and finding ways of making things better. And I think we should do a lot more of that. We should say globally, how can we improve how we do conservation? Next, I'd like to think about what's the toolkit of information do we want? So we've just started thinking about this, and uh, any ideas are sort of welcome. So we can say we want to measure the pressures, and we've got this um, the Global Forest Watch, we've got Firecast, very topical now. So that's collating the information on threats. We've got information on status. So we've got the biodiversity data. We've got the Living Planet Index. See, I think that was GBIF, the first one, telling us where species are. We've got the red list. We've got the protected data list. And then we've got the response. We've got conservation evidence. What, I'm, what we want to do is think about how do we bring together all the information that we as a community wants uh, as a sort of toolkit? So when we've got a conservation problem, we've got all the different bits sitting there, and we can then work out how we can be more efficient. So what we've been doing is building up the evidence base. I described the conservation evidence website, and that is the evidence synthesis part. We take the published information, and the non-English information, and the unpublished information, and we review that. We make it so it's available for everybody to use. So what do you do then? We think there are three stages that we haven't really thought enough about. The first is evidence assessment. So in medicine, if there's a, um, uh, a, uh, a drug for dealing with COVID or cancer or something like that, it's very likely to work everywhere in the world. So you just say, this is the best thing to do. I'm going to use it. In conservation, it's much more complicated the local conditions will matter, and the species that you apply it on will matter. So we need to take the global information and say, does this refer to the problem I've got here? Uh, and, and we need to think hard about how we do that. And then when we've said, this is the evidence as to whether or not it works, we then need to make a decision as to how to do it and whether to do it. Well, we need to include the costs. We need to include our values. So your values might be, um, do you want to use a herbicide or for dealing with that invasive plant as it's a protected area? Uh, do you want to be excluding people from an area? Do you want to have grazing in that area, etc.? There's all sorts of things that people will differ 
as to what they want to do. And then you take your experience. So what do I know about this site? What do I know? And you put that all together and you make your decision. And then when you made that decision, how do you actually use it? What's the means of delivering? So you might just apply it. You might put in, it into your plans, your management plans or whatever. Or you might have tools for decision making. And how can we take that information and put it in such tools? And to me, it seems that where the, the synthesizing the information is really the expensive bit, but we've largely done that. What we need to do now is think about how do we assess information for local conditions, how do we make decisions, and then how do we deliver? And of course, when it comes to applying it, when of course it comes to applying conservation on the ground, uh, that's going to cost quite a lot of money as well. So, next knowledge gap, we need to identify our key knowledge gaps and fill them. So if you look at the, uh, the literature on conservation evidence, you see there's many actions for which there's very little science, sometimes no science. And we need to then fill those gaps. Next, we need to encourage new ideas. It seems to me that, that we're not generating a lot of new ideas in the way that business is doing. So what are the different solutions? And particularly letting lots of other people know what those different solutions are. When we've got a problem, surely we should be learning from each other and we should be encouraging people to think of different ways of solving problems. The next one is we really want to standardize the terms we use. So why is that? The problem is that, and this is very boring, but it's very important. We want to have a standard term so we all know what we're doing, so that when you put this information together, you know that if you're trying to reduce road casualties it's the same as reducing road mortality it's the same as making roads safer all of those different terms they should have the same term because then you can build them into automated systems and that's really what we want to do and we really want to find ways of monitoring them in the same way because if people monitor them in different ways when you pull that information together it's very hard to do because everyone's looking at different bits of information uh, next, we want to embrace society. So all I'm saying is we want to think about how we can become relevant to more people. How can we become relevant to a wider community, encourage citizen science, encourage people to go out and monitor things, but also work with other areas, economics, management, marketing. We need to take our science and make it relevant to a big community. And we can only do that by embracing wider society. Next, what we call declaration of studies. So there's, um, there's a whole host of problems with the way we do science at the moment. One of which is called submission bias, which means that if, the, if you do something and it works, you publish it. And if you do something and it doesn't work, we don't publish it. And we know that's a big problem. There's also what's called harking or hypothesis after results are known or manipulating the analysis. So the more you describe your results, the methods beforehand, the less likely it is that people have sort of adjusted the methods to give you the right sort of results. There's also you can, uh, if you make the results available, the methods available, other people comment on it. Um, if you let people know what you're doing beforehand, uh, then you're more less like less like just because, because uh, it didn't seem to work. Uh, and then finally, the fifth one: um, people tend in grant proposals to describe all sorts of bits of work. That's kind of impossible for you to do all of that. If you had to, as part of your grant proposal, declare beforehand the studies and then comment afterwards on whether or not you'd succeed them. It would stop people promising all sorts of things they can't do. 
So what we're suggesting here is we really want to move to a position where when you're about to start a study, you declare it beforehand on a website. Uh, and then once you've done it, you then say where the results are. So you always know whether studies have been written up afterwards. And it reduces a lot of these biases. So the whole issue of declaration, we think, is very important. So the idea is you could just, this could be in the website, Applied Ecological Resources. You can outline your plans. I'm going to introduce this species in this location, in this way, and I'm going to monitor it for the next two years. Uh, and if it didn't happen, you can then say, well, actually it didn't happen for these reasons. And then when your study is finished, you can then say, and this is where I published that study. And that would then give you a link. You can then look to see who else has been studying this. What are all the studies looking at introductions or looking at road mortalities or looking at ways of stopping problems with tigers or whatever it is. All those studies will be together in one site, and you can see who's written that study up and who hasn't. So we think that's an important thing to be doing in the future. Improved decision making. So with Mark Bergman, who I showed you earlier, we, um, we wrote this piece in Nature where we talked about how you can improve the decision making. And the simple message is that the way in which we tend to make decisions is we ask an expert or we ask a group of experts what to do. And it turns out that there are much better ways of making decisions. So if you have a group of people, that's better than having one person. If you ask them to vote on what works, that's better than not. If you make it anonymous, so you get rid of the bias, so the men, the, otherwise you listen to the most prestigious person and all that sort of thing. If it's, if it's anonymous, that's much easier. Uh, you have a discussion and then you then vote on that. There's all sorts of ways in which we can make decisions so we're more likely to get the right answer. And what we're saying is we really think we should think about that decision-making process. Thirteenth issue. There are lots of new technologies coming up. And we really want to think hard about how we use those. So just as a few examples, I'm sure you all know of these. There's environmental DNA. So you can take water samples and see which species are present in that water body, that river system. More people are doing acoustic surveys where you put microphones out and you can see the various, you can see what you can hear and learn from that. There's machine learning, which is moving very fast. So you can take a photograph of an animal or a bird, and it will then tell you what it is. And then our plant versions, that is just getting much better. And then the robotics. So you can send robots out, you can send drones out to go and collect samples. Um, it's a bit scary for those of us that like the idea of going out in the field and doing surveys, but it shows that there are very different ways of working. And I think in the future, conservation will be very different from what it is now. So that's my 15 point plan. And what I hope I've suggested is that this is a way in which we can make conservation a lot more effective. And I think we need to think as to whether or not we want to do that. Do we want this challenge of moving forward, this challenge of finding more effective ways of working uh, and making conservation more effective, and I think making it more attractive to funding. And so I think this, we hear a lot about the conservation problems globally. We need a plan for improving that. And what I try to do is to provide an overall plan how we can improve conservation. Thank you. Shepi. Shepi. Professor? Uh, now we can open the session for any interaction or discussion. Okay, okay. Uh, 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 Professor, sir.
uh, thank you for your you uh, know uh, is very wonderful talk and very you know uh, informative talk uh, uh, very nice it was very nice now we can discuss with the audience if they are supposed to have any questions okay. now open to all if you want to discuss or you know uh, with anything else with the dr sadarland sir you can do please now the question session is started audience can talk to dr professor william sutherland hi sir can you hear me yes right uh, we met at the uh, 2020 secs in cambridge i was um, the uh, volunteer for the conservation evidence workshop i have uh, a whole host of questions uh, again sorry I said, nice to see you again. Ah, it's likewise, sir. It's it, it's wonderful to see you. Um, I have a host of questions. Two directly related to your talk. Two vaguely related to to what we're talking about. So I'm going to start with the related ones. First, first things, things first, first uh, about about declaration. What if um, you have certain participants in the project, say a government? Side participant, or a forest department side participant, or um, say a wildlife trust, or something like that, that perceives a conflict of interest in declaration. What would you suggest in that case? So I suspect. So one of the things we thought about is sometimes it will need to be confidential because, um, or confidential for some time. Either it's a very good idea, it's a study that you you know you, you don't want to other people to know you're a very clever idea, or because uh, if people knew you were doing this, it might be harder to do uh, if the design was sort of out because um, people might then mess it up or something. I guess if there's um, there might be times in which people just don't want to have that. So I guess the question is: Are you saying that you could never publish it then? And I, there probably are studies in which people would say we never want to publish it. Is that there are some saying? cases I've known who, have, who there are some cases I've known where people have been blocked from publishing a paper entirely uh, by people on on the man's side, so to speak. Um, yeah, I think in some ways it helps because because sometimes. I suspect the problem is that people, everyone's happy for the science to happen as long as it gives the right answer. Exactly. Um, and once you've done the science, you've got your results. And um, people will say, "Oh, I don't like that answer. I don't want you to publish it." But if it's declared beforehand, it largely solves that problem because you're committed to publishing it afterwards. And then. You say I'm going to do this experiment with this issue, and then you never write it up. People are going to say, "Well, what happened to that?" So I think it helps solve that problem. Okay. Question number two is in terms of standardization. Is it sensible for people who didn't develop particular techniques to then standardize uh, procedures for them? Um. So, um, I got that question. So, if you're doing if you're doing a survey in one way, do you want to change it? Then that is no. a problem. Well, um, uh, I was thinking more in terms of say um, somebody in Chile had had proposed a particular technique for sampling owl pellets. That's that's new and and you know elegant and beautiful. But um, there's no standardized. Methodology given for it. Does it make yeah. sense for me as an Indian scientist to standardize it um, and methodology for it? So, I accept that's that's a bit of a complicated problem. They um, um, our thinking is if we've got a new and better way of doing it, then we want to do that. Obviously, yes. you know, if there's, a te- if there's a technique in Chile that is much better for looking at our pellets. Then you should adopt it. But the problem we have is that um, very often people just have different ways of doing things in a trivial way. So um, 
I don't know that much about owl pellets, but I know sometimes people record, you know, if you found half a jaw, is that one wood mouse, is that one mouse or half a mouse? It's actually half a mouse. But you yeah. kind of want to record it as such, but some people record it as one. Um, or for bird surveys, there are sometimes very good reasons why you want a technical survey that's different. And in that mm -hmm. case, you do it. But if you're doing a standard survey, why don't we agree on some standard techniques that are comparable rather than you just inventing your own techniques so that they're not comparable? Okay. So we're kind of just, we're not saying you cannot do something different. You're not, cannot do something new, but don't, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to have a survey, then why don't we agree how how long your transect's going to be? Or if you're going to do a point count, how different, how, what your distance bars are, and how long yeah. you're going to do it for. Yeah. Okay. Halfway there. Number three is, uh, do you have any advice on, because this is something that I'm personally working on right now, do you have any advice on a single site-specific management plan without any evidence backing it up for, for more or less most of the major issues. So a, a specific management plan? Well, I'm looking at a site-specific management plan for a critically endangered red list species. Um, and I'm planning to man manage the entire site around it rather than the species itself. Um, but the threats that are on the site and the current sort of um, effects that are uh, plaguing the site don't have many um, pieces of conservation evidence surrounding them as to what works to mitigate them. And yep. so what's your approach to that? So we are um, uh, we're thinking about this just now. Hmm. So we're thinking about, and perhaps we should chat more, we're thinking about saying, how do you create evidence-based management plans? Hmm. So one of the things we, we've done a lot more work on is how do you create evidence-based guidance? So you probably have this in India, but we have guidance saying this is the best way of creating a pond, this is the best way of looking at the bats or putting tunnels on the roads. This sort of guidance is often used, but you don't know where it comes from. Uh, and so we're creating rules for sort of how do you make sure that the evidence is used. And what we want to do next is do the same for management. So if you're writing a management plan, how do you know what the evidence says and what do you do when there isn't evidence? And the thing what you do when there isn't evidence is you kind of, you look to see what knowledge there is, use your experience, and you say, well, we don't. We don't really know. There isn't much, but our, our, our you know, the likely guess from a group of experts is this, and you and you make that entirely clear. And that's what we really want to do: is you just make it clear there isn't any information, but this seems a sensible thing to do. Right. And you know where you stand, and it says, well, really, we want some more evidence for that. Lastly, what is your on um, the usage of eco-psychology and nature connectedness stuff on uh, outreach both towards policy makers and stakeholders at a local level. Um, so, um, I, think, I think this is a wide open area and I'm not, so my obsession is with testing action. And I would like, and I, and I don't know much about this, and feel free to correct me, but I don't think there are that many studies which say, if you go in the local community and you do this, yeah. words, if you do this, that doesn't work. And that, I think, no. is what we really need to know. We really need to know the same way as you say, if I want to deal with an invasive plant, if I chop it down, it does this, and I spray it, it does this. We really want to say, if you go into a community of a certain sort, then if you do it this way, it's terrific, and this way is disastrous. And we really need, we really need a whole body of, of conservation psychological literature. Yeah. 
Once you're billion, that's all my mind wants to do that. It's a I, wide open I'm subject. I'm planning to study right now on, on something like that. You're doing that now? Uh, I'm, I'm planning on doing, starting uh, doing surveys in December, yeah. Brilliant. But, See, test that. Yeah, <laughs> test that. That's what we need. You're on the cutting edge of conservation there. Because you, you're right. Because you, you can say, a particular, and I think it depends on the action. So some things like uh, the road example I gave, or treating an invasive plant, you just go and do it. But other actions, like uh, setting up a marine reserve, the success of that is almost entirely on your interactions with those communities. You know, the idea of the marine, marine reserve it might be a good idea, but the details of how you do it are absolutely critical. And we need, we need a lot more studies. So you're on the cutting edge of conservation. Thank you very much. It was extremely important. Good to uh, Thank you, Aditya uh, Srinivasalo. Next year, anybody? Good evening. Good evening. I am uh, Dr. Sakya Narayana, retired Dr. Associate Professor from the Division of ILA College and Zuwalwal Devi Devi College. I think I have one time that what is, what is the opinion with regard to legal protection to the animal, whether it is an effective conservation to the government or this? The legal protection. protection. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, well, the legal protection, if I understand your question, um, yeah. can be exceptionally effective, but it all depends on uh, the application. So it all yeah. depends on the, um, the local conditions and the acceptability of it to society and uh, the the whole set of governance issues. So you can make something legally protected, but unless there's the um, people making sure that that's uh, enacted, it won't work. So you've got to think so, hard about how you set about laws. And one more last question is that. Uh, what's your opinion? What is the practice in throughout the world regarding the conversion of the traditional museum into the digital museum with regard to the wild animals? And also, what is the uh, effective tools they have followed in the different universities and uh, the system in the UK and other countries regarding the animal alternatives for the training the students in the colleges and the uh, schools? So, sorry, could you say that again? Yeah, you know, no, uh, what I mean is that what, what is that the role of the digital museum in the conservation of the animals? Of, of the museums? Yeah. Uh, okay, the, if, I, if I've got. Yeah, in the, in the, in the, 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 question, the question is what's the role of museums? So, oh. the, those of you that have been to Cambridge know we have a zoology museum here. Oh which is sort of central to the way in which we work and okay. that they have a huge amount of biodiversity information stored within them. So museums, museums with their information and their capacity to educate are pretty key. Uh, and, you know, herbariums as well. Oh, thank you very much. No. It's a pleasure. No, no. Professor Sutherland, sir. Uh, Professor MCS are asking, uh, how that you are uh, using the alternate in the lab dissection for students, no? practical. Is the man is working on alternatives in uh, zoo animal dissection, practical hours. In India, uh, like, uh, like the MCSR, MCSR, there is a committee, committee so, so they, they are preventing killing of animal, animal uh, during, during the practical hours, hours particularly in the zoology, zoology dissection. No, no dissection. dissection. Is there any alternative methods are adopted at UK instead of live animal? What sort of practical you are giving to the student? Like, so we, um, I don't think we do any dissections. Uh, that I'm, uh, I might, I don't teach first year. I don't think we have um, a course where they look at the diversity of life. But I'm not sure that they they use a lot of museum specimens, 
but I'm not sure they actually dissect them. I, I might be wrong there. Um, but certainly that section, that section used to be very common in courses, and now, and in my previous existence, uh, my previous job, uh, we phased out dissections there, so we didn't have them at all. So it's becoming a lot less common in most of the courses. Okay. okay. And that, and that is very popular with the Thank students. You. The students tend not to like dissections. Okay, next. Hello, please, gentlemen, you can ask anybody. Like like to ask anybody. Sir? Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. Sir, I agree with one question regarding cancer suggestion. Yeah. Sir? Yes, proceed. The precautions should be effectively bared. To stay well the demand. To stay well the demand. To the type of, to the type of calamity. Natural calamities. Hello, can you repeat your question once again? What precautions should be effectively made to save wild animals at the time of natural calamities? Natural natural disaster. During during natural disaster, what tool has to be adopted? What technique to be adopted to save the wildlife? Is this question? So what so what's what's um, um, the role in natural, natural disasters? disasters? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, how do how we, do we protect, protect the, uh, the animals, animals during the during natural, natural disasters? disasters? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so um, I guess the the issue is whether or not there's a reservoir somewhere. So if you have a fire or you have a tsunami or something like that, very often there is you, you don't kill the entire population. If there is if there is something whereby there's a very small population, it makes a lot of sense to go and rescue that population. You know, that, and there are examples, the, um, uh, the cockfish in America is a classic example. They only occurred in one pool. It was drying out, and the reserve warden completely illegally uh, caught them all and put them in buckets and took them home, uh, uh, which he had no right to do and no permit to do. Uh, but because he did that, it means that the population survived, and otherwise it would have died out. So I think... I think, think if it is very low localized, you need to do that. Do that. If it has, a, if it can persist somewhere else, we then just need to ensure that we can uh, we uh, still, we still have, have it as quickly as possible, as possible. Uh, and, and, and try to get, get, get it back to its usual range. range. And then, of and course, course there's the important issue of the role of the environment in using uh, natural, natural disasters. disasters. So, so we, we know, know how important mangroves are and Forests up in the mountains are for reducing soil erosion, etc., etc. And and the role of trees and marshes in reducing global warming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, I do have a question. Uh, in fact, when we are talking about this conservation, particularly the stakeholders who are depending on the forest resources are fringes. For example, in our case, the, the selfish man who is collecting. And when we are going for that uh, kind of uh, conservation, the conflict always uh, gives, even within the human being, we people conservationists, we really want to protect but on the other hand they are depending on that particular animal for their survival but it is uh, in a lot of models we have seen whenever the uh, people who are picking up uh, the pakuls or mussels don't give that much problem when we go for the kind of uh, mechanized boat that is the time we but mm -hmm. those things we are against but these kind of uh, people who are depending on their uh, uh, survival the forest resources in lot of indian forests when we go for any conservation they make it uh, common for all the people when those kind of situation comes they really as a researcher when you go to the field you can see they really depend on that 
we are trying our level best to find the alternatives but even in most of the cases it is not that much because of uh, their uh, uh, skill which they have developed that very on all sorts of things but now we are slowly changing the next generation but still people who depend on the forest really have no other choice in those kind of situation what kind of uh, mechanism or what kind of things we can think in sensitive areas yes yeah, so so a lot of this i think depends on community ownership that um that once once community have rights and can see that they genuinely have rights uh and that uh it then makes sense for them to conserve in the longer term and it makes sense for them and if they have the right so they can stop the cockle fishing the or the, the large scale fishing from taking place because they want to protect them in the longer term that seems to be key to an awful lot of it but giving community ownership uh, and once you do that, people tend to protect their community because they realize that it's uh, it's for their long-term benefit. If they cannot protect their, their community and others are coming and taking it as well, then you might as well go and take it. So I think the more you can create that, um, that model with the actual genuine rights of protection, then uh, the easier that becomes. Thank you. There are few questions in the chat box. When you look at the chat box, there is one important question. Can I read that question otherwise? Uh, okay. Otherwise, I will read the bill. Oh, yeah, you read it out. Yeah, no, I can't. Okay, let's see that. Professor, Dr. Nagarajan, I have one question. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. chat box. Yeah. First of all, I would like to thank uh, for organizing a wonderful uh, webinar, especially with uh, Dr. Bill. Uh, for you, for that, you have to thank you, Dr. Nairajan, as well as the entire team. Uh, Bill, I have uh, one question. For assessing, uh, in order to ascertain the condition of biodiversity, it is necessary to closely monitor different indicators across the planet, including indicators of phenology, migratory behavior, bio indicator species population age, structure, underworld, species contributions. In this aspect, I wanted to know what are the aspects, that means what are the advantages and disadvantages does the involvement of citizen scientists have you measuring the biodiversity? Because we not, um, as a scientist, as a people working in the field of conservation, you might be have a now uh, what way we people can work when compared to uh, as uh, citizen scientists, if we are involved to measuring the biodiversity, what are the aspects and advantages and dis disadvantages is there? Could you explain that? Yeah, sure. So, um, citizens, so there are advantages, as you say, the advantages and disadvantages of both. The advantages of the standard scientific approach is you have standard measures, and if it is something that is technical, so it's a bird survey, then people go out and carry out those measures repeatedly. Um, and that is a good thing to do. The problem is that that is a very expensive thing to do. And so normally can only be done in small numbers of places. So if you can find ways of doing citizen science that is rigorous, then you can then it's extremely powerful there's a lot of citizen science which is horribly biased you know so let me know if you see this particular species that information is because you only you only hear about it if someone sees that species so, uh, make sure that the studies are created in a rigorous way so that um, uh, there's not bias in the way it's collected and if you can do that then the citizen science can be extremely effective and the best information we have on monitoring in Britain is our bird populations and that bird population data is all citizen science data 
that is extremely effective if done well, but you have to set it up in a very careful way. Thank you, Dr. Bill. Thank you, Dr. Nagarajan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bro, sir, Can I read, read the question? Can I read the question from the chat box? Yeah. That is. There is one question, Madhumida. Do you think publishing research work around conservation is overemphasizing on the complex statistics, which is taking out the essence of the original work, which otherwise could have been published in more understandable way? Yeah, that is. Um, so we have a journal called Conservation Evidence, and the idea of that is to provide simple stu studies that um, uh, make it usable to practitioners. And I think often you need the, and, and we have some very simple studies there, uh, which are actually very interesting. So as an example, people put up nest boxes for swifts, we don't know if you put a nest cup in there, whether or not that's better. And so this person I know, in every second nest box, he put a little nest cup. And then he looked at the, the number of nest boxes occupied and showed there was a big effect. And he's done little experiments like that. And if you do those really well-designed experiments, you don't need complicated experiments. You need the complicated statistics where you have the messy experimental design. So what we would do is encourage people to think of simple tests. And if you have simple tests, okay. then mute <laughs> sir. Please continue, sir. Sorry. So, so if you have if you have those simple experimental designs, then you don't need complicated statistics, uh, and that to me is the solution. Thank you. There is one more question. Marine fisheries resources are over exploited. What will be the conservation measures to replace the fishery stock? Um, well, there's a whole host of these, um, and we've written we've written a paper looking at what the possible all the possible measures are, and we're now looking at what the evidence says. And we've only just started that, um, but there are some obvious wins. The one of the major ones is that we. Uh, we subsidize fishing. We Globally, we subsidize fishing by the cost of the benefit of the fisheries. So we pay as much money to the fishing community as the value of the, the fishing that they produce. Uh, and we do that for, for social reasons, and it seems a good idea. But it's a terrible idea, because if you subsidize fishing, then people fish more and we overexploit. Uh, so we want to remove the subsidies in fishing. And, and it's a bit hard for people in the short term, but it means they will fish less and they will get more fish and they'll make bigger profits. So that's where we want to move to. Um, but we also need to do a lot more on bycatch. Um, uh, and marine protected areas. Marine protected areas seem to be extremely effective. So the more we can have marine protected areas, which act as a reservoir, so there are lots of fish within the marine protected areas, and then they can go out to the wider community. Um, so the, there's a whole host of different possible ways, but it is very complicated. But reducing demand is key. 
There are uh, two more questions, Bill, in the chat box. Hello. Uh, can I ask can a question, question sir? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Will, uh, very nice presentation. Uh, I have a very basic question. Uh, whatever in conservation science we practice, don't you think it is limited to certain privileged people who can read and process that kind of complex information and then can understand. But there's a millions of people in India and across the world who could only process basic English, otherwise only can process their regional languages. So are we reaching out to those people and making the conservation information to connect with people so they could understand and in turn they could support the conservation? Because many times if people of the country fail to understand what we are doing, they will support it. So don't you think it's just limited to, to certain people and uh, I mean we do uh, education awareness program, we do have this, you know, other sort of things, NGOs and all that thing, but still are we failing to connect people with information? Yeah, no, I am, um, in fact I included a slide on this which I removed about 10 minutes before <laughs> my talk, which about okay. uh, yeah. what we think we should do is you you have the global evidence available mm -hmm. and then you work with the local people and say what is it that the uh what are the issues that we think we should discuss so for example what are the problems ways of dealing with that? Mm -hmm. and you then look at the global evidence and you say here's the global evidence how does it make sense for this particular um, uh, community in India. If you take the global evidence, uh, how do you interpret that for this particular location? Mm -hmm. And you then, and that, that tells you what the science says. We then work with the local community and you say, so what do you know? So we divide it into sort of knowledge, which is the facts that they know, and kind of the experience that they're sort of, they're just sort of things from having been around, they know what they're yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you bring a group of people together. You, you bring some outside experts that understand the evidence. You bring some local people that understand what the local knowledge means. And you bring the stakeholders who really care about this issue. Mm -hmm. people. And you then say, so what is, what does the knowledge say, the combined local knowledge and scientific knowledge, uh, and bearing in mind the concerns of the community, what is it that you're going to do? How are you going to create a plan that will uh, do this? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, like, like you have already mentioned in uh, one of your slides, like uh, translating into different languages, how we can help people to understand. So, uh, I mean, that's a great idea. Uh, I, I'm also working in, in, in the same scenario to create an app where in India each and every people can access certain complex science or articles which is published in journals and even let's say journals also many people doesn't have any access. I mean, you know, so even being a researcher or a student, you cannot access certain journals which is paid or which is, you know, you have to create an access to that. So forget about the other people who, you know, can't even access in their whole life. So, so creating an app where we can reach these, we can take these signs, create it to in a simplest form in the regional languages and take to their fingertips. So people who know a lot of things where they're associated with nature since the years, they will understand a little difference can make a difference. We know this, but how to utilize this in a, in a sustainable manner, this is what we are, you know, trying to connect the, those information with the people and then act on the ground level. So, so yeah, I mean, just, just to add to that. Uh, that. That is really important. There's, yeah. um, there's a program called the Translate Project, which is okay. run by Tatsuo Amano in uh, Japan. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, and he is very interested in the impact of language on conservation. Mm -hmm. So he's interested both in using the global literature but also in getting information out to people in different languages. Uh, yeah, yeah. And he's the leader in this field. So it seems as though what you're doing mm -hmm. is really important. 
they're interesting. So I would get in touch with him and co- copy sure, me sure. in. Interesting. Sure, sure, yeah. And I'll write to both of you guys. Yeah, sure. Yeah, indeed. No, that'd be great. Right, because right. that, and then the other thing I think is often the scientific information isn't what people want. What people want is this sort of guidance. Exactly, exactly, exactly. yeah, yeah. Okay. Here's how it's explained, and you want people to so, do some guidance. Yeah, yeah. So the agenda is simple, connecting people with the information. And, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. let the conservation survive. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah. I have got some from the same college along with the voice is dripping. Can you talk from your voice is dripping? I mean, I will know, sir. Otherwise, I could just post my. Yeah. If I'm not audible, I could post my post in the. No, no, you are are audible, but from that place, you can ask. Don't yeah, move. Yeah. Now the time is audible. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. My question is pertaining to the previous question, sir. Yes. Linking people is always important in conservation times, actually. If that is the case, uh, we are failed enough to link the countries who are working towards the climate change and mitigation aspect. If that is the case, if that is the case, we can able to work on other aspects aspect of conservation. Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand. So the, the question is how do we collaborate more? Is that right? I think if that is the question, um, I think there's a lot more that we can do. Uh, and I gave a couple of examples of this where we, we worked as a sort of global community rather than different countries. And I think that's what that is the way forward. If we say, how do we agree on a plan how do we agree on making sure we have a toolkit of information? How do we um, uh, make sure we share information and work globally rather than all working individually? Which is how I think a lot of conservation works at the moment. It's producing, it's producing a global plan, a global way of working, where we, you know, India does lots of great conservation. It's, you know, many um, uh, their, their leaders in conservation. How do we learn all the work that's been done in India and apply it elsewhere in the world. Any other question? Sir, one more question. Please, sir. Please, please, continue, sir. Please. No, 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 just to complete your question. Finish it. Do you have any other question? Do you have any other question? Jai Kamal, do you have any question? Okay. Professor Sutherland. I'm done. Thank you. Professor? Professor? No, no. It's one more question. One more question through you, people. How? How do we know do we know how much how evidence much is evidence is sufficient to draw a conservation draw a conservation, conservation related, policy. related policy? I will repeat now. I will repeat now. How do we how know do we know how much how evidence much is evidence is sufficient to draw a conservation a conservation related, related policy? policy? Uh, oh, that's um, that's a good question. Uh, I think well, it depends on often the risk. So, um, and what the consequence would be of not doing it. So, um, so sometimes something is just obvious or something is trivial, so you just go and do it. Uh, sometimes you've got to make a decision quickly and you use whatever little bits of information there are and just do it. Sometimes you say, well, this is really important and I've really got to get this right and the science isn't here yet, therefore we need to collect more science. But I think the thing we need to acknowledge is that that is rarely going to be the case. It's rarely the case that we can say we're just going to delay our decision making until we've got more science. Almost always we have to make the decisions now, which doesn't mean we can't get more science afterwards. 
Uh, so we need to then think about how we're going to make the decision, making the best use of the evidence, and then what actually is it we would like to know. So let's go and study that so we can come back in another year or two's time and then see what we've learned from that and whether or not we should change our decision. Okay, thank you. Pleasure. Uh, one, uh, one more, more question, question in the chat box. box. Do you, Do you think, think Zudo Zudo replication is a Zudo issue? Do you think Zudo replication is a Zudo issue in conservation biology, especially for very heterogeneous landscapes? For instance, comparing large mammals in different agro ecosystems. That is your opinion. Um, so, Zudo replication is a serious problem. So, um, and study design. Uh, is a serious problem. So, uh, with a, a very clever PhD student called Alec Christie, we've done a series of studies. Uh, so, some came out in Journal of Applied Ecology. And that showed that the way in which you did the study really mattered. So, if you did a before and after controlled intervention experiment, you're very likely to get the right answer with the moderate sample size. If you just do a before and an after or controlled, or if you just do an after experiment where you do something and monitor what happens, you're very likely to get the wrong answer. So these sorts of issues like pseudo replication are really important. Sometimes you just have to do them because that's all that is possible uh, in this particular location. But we really should be doing all we can to improve experimental design. It is a very important issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question. What is your insight on how do landscape restoration contribute conservation to ensure sustainability? I will repeat. What is your insight on how do landscape restoration contribute conservation to ensure sustainability? It, it is key. Uh, so um, if we want to improve this planet, we want to reduce global warming, we want to uh, reduce floods, improve water quality, reduce damage on coastal systems, all those sorts of things, then we want to restore the landscape on a large scale. Uh, uh, and we need to find out ways of doing that. Uh, and there's more happening. We're now in the decade, the United Nations decade of restoration. It is a major issue, but we need a lot more work. We need a lot more science as to how to do it and where to do it. Uh, but uh, it's absolutely key for sustainability. Okay, the one more class question. Uh, what the role of bat or uh, pangolin is spreading COVID-19? <laughs> Maybe not relevant, but uh, what do you think about emerging infectious disease and oil animal? So, um, I don't know. The details of that seems very complicated. And I, each time I read it, the sort of the story seems to get a bit more complicated. And it's not clear exactly where COVID-19 came from. Uh, and bats, horseshoe bats and pangolins, pangolins may well be involved, horseshoe bats seem a bit involved. Um, so I don't really know exactly where it came from. Uh, what we have done though, is we've written a paper to say, how do you stop future pandemics from taking place? And the reason we did it was because there were um, lots of what we thought rather simplistic arguments. So some people said we should shut down wet markets in China. Uh, wet markets are just markets that sell, you know, it's, you have dry markets where you can buy rice and things, and wet markets where you can buy things that are wet, like, or washed, like vegetables and fish and meat and those sorts of things. So shutting down wet markets, you know, you're just not going to do that. Uh, or you could say you could stop hunting, but lots of people around the world survive on hunting or you could just say well we should ban pangolin trade 
we've already banned pangolin trade into China. You know, that's already happened. So, um, so there's lots of calls for rather simple solutions. Uh, and I think we need to have a more complicated way of looking at that. And so what we did is a global team of us came together and said, what are actually the global possible answers? Uh, and we need to then look at those and decide on much more complicated ways of finding solutions here. There's not going to be a solution to stopping the next pandemic because they come from a whole range of different sources and they have very complicated routes and it's going to be quite, quite a complicated solution to reduce the pandemic risk. Sir, question number, question, question number increase from Lama, what's the question there again? What's the question there again? Bill, do you have any time for any more, any more questions? Sir, can we discuss you already informed us that you have to be uh, have some work in the afternoon? Already, it is a lunch time for you. So, yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's, do, let's do two more. Yeah, if you have any question, dear participants, please ask because he is uh, keen to answer the question, but try to be quick because, because he is in, in the lunch time. time. Or, or I like what what could we what should we as a global community be doing to ensure that uh, Indian conservation science is fully integrated within the rest of the world? What's the way of making us more global? So that's my question. So your question for all the Indian participants. Yeah, how do we make it? Bill, can you come closer to the mic and ask the question a bit louder because not many people hearing your voice. Oh, can see, you repeat okay. the, yeah. My question is, how do we make conservation more global? How do we bring together all the different global communities to make sure that we're collaborating and we're all learning from each other? Here, participants, you can respond yeah. or use question. Professor, yeah, uh, one by one. Professor, it is a kind of wonderful question where you know, whatever we wanted to ask, you know, that you have asked us a question. Probably your answer Probably your is answer answer for your question as well. Your like, as no, we need, like, to, work no, we need together, to work together and you know, with the language, language barrier, barrier, you know, with the, with the, with the collaboration barrier, collaboration we barrier, need to work together, work and together and transform and the, transform the information, to information to all other countries. Like, what, country, like, what is happening in the climate change, change. Not be like that. should not be like that. Because there is a huge because there disparity between developed and developed countries in terms of mitigating the global climate change aspect. So we need to avoid so avoid and then things and then you know we need come to forward, come forward without without expecting anything. anything. We come forward and, and try to work on biodiversity, which is which acting is acting as the solution, solution for us. It is almost a kind of, kind of you know, pandemic, pandemic dilution, dilution factor. factor. So, so when biodiversity become, become a dilution factor, factor again, again, pandemic, pandemic, we, we everybody should come forward and work together. Thank you, thank you, Professor. 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 What is your opinion, professor? What is my opinion? Ah. <laughs> um, I think the sort of ways in which you've discussed, but I think, I think we want ways. I think what we should do is find a way that we come together and try and agree a plan. So I think at the moment we tend to be working. There are different groups creating a plan, but we really want to come together and say, how do we solve these problems collectively? And I think we're not really doing that. I don't think we've got a, we've got sort of global targets. We haven't got a global plan for how we're going to work together and solve these problems. And I think that's what we need. Okay. And Bill, and I, Bill also I also feel that, feel that there are two aspects. aspects. For example, For example, the long, the long migratory species, species like birds, birds are, uh, are uh, insects. insects. There are, there are several, several groups, groups which are farmed farm across, across its migratory route. route. For, For example, spoonbill spoon sandpiper, sandpiper scenario, scenario which you know no. very well. well. Those, Those kind, kind of species, species can, can tackle very, very well. well. But, but a lot, lot of problems problem in a lot of countries related to endemic species, species which only they can, can do. And, and most probably sometimes they can uh, repeat some of the conservation issues which are being uh, addressed and uh, measures which are being given in one country being 
used in other scenario which big which brings more disaster for example uh, in our own country in india we have uh, a problem with the cattle grazing by seeing uh, cattle grazing issue in lot of protected areas they stopped the cattle grazing which ultimately improved the succession therefore the habitat completely changed and we lost a lot of uh, species and most often i would say that uh, you read paper or uh, other things to gain the knowledge to know the procedures to to develop the methods and use those kind of things for your local situation lot of time particularly the youngsters it is quite normal and i am not blaming they have a lot of preconceived notion from the papers after that when they go to the field if it is not happening they themselves feel that they are not doing the right thing once even when i was a phd student i was telling something to uh dr john gaskerter uh, as well as stephen lee uh, professor stephen lee it is being described, described like, like that, that. But in Lundi, the birds are behaving this way. They both uh, see, uh, have seen my face and laughed, and they said that the uh, bird did not read the paper so far. That is the problem. You have to make the bird. So those kind of situation exist. This is one scenario I am looking at, and uh, most often you trust your result and you trust your approach. You get. acclimatized with the output which you are having so the output what they are getting is different from what they read in the paper those kind of things needs to be addressed open mindedly that could improve one thing and in my personal experience as i am a person from a rural village whenever i we do any hard research work that is being simply said by a old man who is living in the village we never uh, have had the chance to discuss with them after 3 years what i found with uh, so many statistics or technology and tools that person describe in 50 percentage of the information without any of these things so linking this uh, brainstorming session with uh, local people particularly in this kind of conservation areas where uh, the places where we have conservation problem because they live there for almost 50 years 60 or 70 years they have seen the dramatic change therefore they can say that uh, some places which is missing in the name of science in the name of uh, education in the name of technology we completely ignoring the knowledgeable people who are merely uh, so called illiterate Well, they are knowledgeable. They did not go to university and got the degree. Therefore, those kind of things if you link in lot of places after three years, four years, I found that that can be easily explored by discussing with all the people who are living in that area. That is my experience after getting lot of grey hair. When I had the black hair, I myself worked, but now I am talking to the old people there. I am getting lot of information. That I would say that can be. easily talk to the village people then you can language barrier but as a local person you can talk to them and you get the information and you can check and you can go for uh, some valid scientific research then publication and those. this kind of uh, uh, incorporating more of local people who are old enough uh, to be ignored by us can be included in this conservation issue this is my personal experience bill And, that, and, and that's a that's a perfect summary to it all. I think that's exactly, exactly right. right. I think, I think and, it, and it's, it's very, very complicated, complicated. But we we need that that combination of science and local knowledge and local experience and working out how to deal with that and dealing with the real world problems um, uh, with that on the ground information. It's exactly right. A nice summary. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Professor, uh, Professor, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll love to add. Love to add so, uh, so, uh, Professor Arun said, said really a great thing. Really a great thing. I mean, uh, uh, there is a lot of information. There is a lot of information. Old people, old people, 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 people The problems may be may be different, but the solution can be the same. Be the same. Or the wise or the wise word. So maybe so maybe I mean, I mean globally globally we need we need to connect more connect more in under in annual annual way so we can so we can exchange, exchange our knowledge, knowledge our problems, problems and indeed and indeed our solutions and 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 then and then maybe maybe you know we can we can create a different.
Yeah, I think that's exactly, I think that's right. exactly right. And, and so we have so a we journal, have a journal called conservation, conservation evidence where people, where people, if you, if you monitor your document, document, we will have, we will have that. that. But also, but also the British the British Society of Conservation Biology also now got uh, locations, uh, locations that are sort of documenting that, including the high resources. But I agree, we do need those sort of discussion forums. People and to really really say, say the way, the way I, see I see it is to say, well, this is what the evidence, evidence says, but what, what else do we learn? learn? And, 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 and how, how can we share that extra level of knowledge? That, 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 that I think is good. Yeah, and especially for the youth from different countries, uh, connecting with, you know, uh, experienced people from the same country or maybe different countries. So uh, that exchange of dialogue openly is needed, what I, what I believe. And yeah. Not into, yeah, into research, but into an academics and, you know, Till the, yeah. till that level where we can generate great leaders. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And one more uh, thing, Bill. Since you asked that question, I am thinking. But most often, when people go for conservation studies, uh, particularly they are looking at the one or two direction, but ecology is multi-direction. Sometimes we are missing some of the main important component. We are looking for one species by making more conservation initiative on that particular species. We are making other species into yeah, endangered species or uh, making their population going down. So these kind of uh, interdisciplinary, as in the, in the first slide you started, the interdisciplinary approach needs to be uh, uh, needs to be uh, done in those kind of conservation when you go for global actions. That is another point, I think. Yeah, and in, indeed, so um... Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're so keen on this issue of standardizing. Because if you then standardize, you can then say what the results yeah. are for everything. Uh, and that's what you need to do. You need to say, if you do this, what are the consequences for, you know, it might be for birds, but for other species of birds, but also for amphibians and plants and across the board, and also for ecosystem services and people. You really need to pull all of that together and then say, these are all the advantages and here are all the different disadvantages. Hey, I would like to join up, uh, join up with Dr. Nagarajan. Whatever you have the researcher, they go with, for example, when somebody has a researcher, they say, invasive species, invasive species, for example, a lantern and the post office. So what I, I request the researchers who are that you go to the field, see the local scenario of the, whether you say invasive species or the unwanted species. As far as I am concerned, when you talk about the biodiversity conservation, you should not use the adjectives. It may be bad or good. Then if we say that bad, the elephant is bad for the local people because they have a lot of conflict. So you start, when you conserve a species, whether it's a plant or animal, kindly what's my opinion on most of the conservation. <laughs> don't use the adjectives of bad, unwanted. If we say the invasive, see the economical aspects, values of that particular school, whether it's a lantern or post office, go and study in depth. What as uh, Dr. Lara rightly pointed out that people go for the elephant with single species conservation. If the elephant only grassland, so they never bother about the other species. For example, the number of animals are depending or the fauna depending on the uh, your lantern or the source of for example, lantern is placed for shelter or for the protection uh, and also for the uh, foraging number of animals is there. So you just study on what are the different animals using this utilization of the, uh, the for example, lantern in an ecosystem in your city area. And then you can assess the economic value so that you have to approach will be very different. People say that it's invasive, invasive lantern but you have to have your own approach, study them in depth and you come to a conclusion that whether it should be retained, whether it should be controlled, or it should be totally eradicated. So that's what my opinion for the young researchers or the uh, next generation researchers. I think that's entirely right, that you want to separate. So what we do in conservation evidence, we don't say good or bad, we just say these are the changes. Uh, and many times, uh, different people will think something is good or bad. So, you know, that if you, um, on a peat bog, then some will like the idea of trees growing, but many people will think that's a bad thing to happen. So you just want to document the change and then get the individual users to say whether or not that's good or not. You, you tease the two apart, I think. So I think that's really important. 
And similarly, if the herbivore increases, you thank know, you. Is that good news or bad news? It sort of it depends on what the herbivore is and whether or not it's a problem or whatever. So it's quite complicated. The cheese apart, the, the values and the, the biology. Thank you, sir. I would also add one more point, uh, Professor. Uh, that uh, conservation more effective uh, delivery, but uh, the conservationists or the policy makers fail to adapt the local people or the community participation, which is very vital. Uh, you know, like you, me, like people, we are we are collecting data and we are publishing research article, and there is no local or regional or vernacular language, which is also another obstacle or the conflict between the export and the local people it should be overcome see conservation means only the specialist or experts involved but that the public or the local people percentage is very very remote that is major lacuna why i would say that in addition in political party the government forming the politician the minister of environment or the minister of forest or the minister of wildlife biology they should have minimum educational qualification to hold that ministry, especially finance minister is doing commerce background. Uh, economics minister, that is economics or commerce. Likewise, our minister is Indian power service like that. But uh, suppose when you are going to uh, give that portfolio to any political party among the uh, uh, candidates selected, we have to uh, give that uh, portfolio, particularly those who are having the basic or fundamental knowledge on environment, ecology, wildlife. Then we can we could deliver more effective conservation. Then uh, we are writing article, publishing book, uh, conducting seminar, workshop, conferences. But it is reaching only the small amount percentage of people. So we have to cover globally from the last citizen to the top expert. It could uh, help us to improve the. Uh, conservation more effectively. That is my suggestion. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no you're, you're exactly, exactly right. right. And it, it is, is, it is, it is a, a very complicated, complicated issue. To say, say is the global, global evidence and how, how you then make, make it relevant, relevant politicians, politicians and practitioners. And I, and I think, think it's by bringing the, the sort of process you talked about, about you bring, bring them together, and you and make, make sure you do their knowledge and their experiences and their concerns, so they're fully involved. But you also make sure that you've got the science in there too. And the worry is that very often we exclude the science and we just have people's experience. So bringing all of those together is a challenge, but I think it's the way you said it's exactly what we need to do. Great. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Professor. like pass any question to Professor, please come and ask. Hello. Okay. That is uh, only one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, this is uh, Naharajan Baskaran from Department of Zoology in C College, Mylord, right? My question uh, uh, no. is that, that uh, unlike the West, much of the developing countries in the East, um, where the local people are depending on the forest, or dependence of uh, local people on the forest it is uh, very high. Conservation, which it does not take into account the local community's need, uh, it has not been successful. And as uh, what Dr. Maharajan pointed out already, uh, that is the uh, most uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, I mean, uh, lacuna in the conservation. And second is that, as you pointed out, conservation to be effective, baseline information 
from irrespective of language needed to be compiled and then that needed to be taken into account for conservation but in the indian scenario or for that matter much of the asian scenario most of the baseline information for many biodiversity or many faunal and floral uh, uh, species are not available and therefore conservation effort has been without any base and only very recently we have got very strong hold on conservation of a tiger taking the ecological data uh, through systematic monitoring and therefore india has you uh, know been successful and an uh, example for the you know, rest of the world in conserving tiger similarly a food been also made for asian elephant but still it has not taken the way in which it has taken for tiger therefore uh, we need still lot more information on the ecological aspects of uh, many flora and fauna for the conservation to be effective and uh, these are the you no know, uh, major uh, aspect which need more focus and uh, it time you know time takes uh, um and yeah. it takes time gradually as time goes uh, you know things may get uh, uh, set on its own and uh, that is what uh, no, my opinion but uh, what is your opinion or no the, about the first question when uh, local people dependence on forests is not really being taken into account or when local people need the next meal when they are not uh, aware about uh, no aware from where it is going to come why i uh, know how they are going to bother about you know what the i uh, know ecological system or how ecological system is going to be developed 10 years down the line or 100 years down the line is my question yeah so two very important issues so the uh bringing together local communities is key for these issues uh and if you don't bring together local communities then they won't carry that so it's just not going to work so so Finding out the most appropriate way of doing that is absolutely essential. Uh, in terms of baseline data, obviously we need to make decisions now. So you can't just you, 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 you have to use the information we have. We also want to be looking ahead and say what is it that we most want to find out. So we should be creating baseline data that we can start using in five or ten years' time and thinking what are the what are the things that aren't being monitored. that we really want to have monitored uh, and and I'm sure we could do that and then set that up and I'm not sure why we don't great great thank you safety we can okay, thank you bro sir okay uh, that's nice there uh, well, yes hello sir i just got one ask hello 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 uh, okay uh, okay, sir, okay. okay. Okay, okay we, we will send the email. Whether my voice is audible? Whether my voice is audible? What is audible? Shout a little bit more. I, 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 I request Doctor. Uh, I request Doctor. Did you send that to offer the WhatsApp text? Yes, we can do it. Yeah. My warm greetings to one and all. I am Mrs. Mrs. D. Shalini, coordinator of the Department of Zoology and Biology at UCC College, and myself has been entrusted with the responsibility of proposing a vote of thanks for the session. And I deem it a great privilege to have this opportunity. First and foremost, I extend my gratitude to the management of UCC College for extending this facility to hold this international webinar successfully. I express my whole heart of thanks to our beloved principal and head of the Department of Zoology and Biology, Dr. R. Nagarajan, for presiding over the function and uh, having delivered a wonderful presidential address. I thank Dr. J. Pandian, Assistant Professor of Zoology and Biology, for introducing our distinguished resource person, Professor William Sutherland. Next, I would like to place on record my humble salutation and sincere thanks to our glorious resource person, Professor William Sutherland, 
Miriam Rothschild, Professor of Conservation Biology, Department of Zoology, University of Cambridge, United Kingdom, for having delivered a lecture on how can we deliver more efficient, effective conservation. The title of the lecture itself has been very fascinating one, which transforms the ideology of many conservationists. Sir has listed out a very highly relevant 15-point plan which could be followed and explained each point wonderfully well so that it could be easily grasped by the audience. Thank you, Professor Bill, for the extraordinary and highly informative session that you have given us today and an extended interaction and discussion with the participants. Thank you once again. Next, I also thank our former professors, Dr. G. Ramaswamy and Dr. M. C. Satyanarayana, sir, for having joined this session. I also thank all of our staff members, scholars, students, and all the wonderful participants worldwide who joined us for this wonderful session. I thank the IQAC coordinator, Dr. P. Andhu Srinivasan, and Dr. R. Kartikeyan, director, R&D Cell, for having graced this session. Thank you, sir. And thank you, one and all. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Ben. We are very much looking forward to have you physically here for the next seminar. So our uh, wholehearted uh, invitation for you. When you have some time, please try to visit this part of India. We are having some quite interesting birds to show you. So it is going to be a wonderful coastal area. So you are most very welcome at any time. I love to. I love to. I, of course, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, Professor. Okay,